Let's see, here I go. I mean, muted as far as the YouTube stuff, if you've got that on, not your mic. What is this? Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Astro Coffee Hangout. We do these every Thursday. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and these hangouts are sponsored by the American Astronomical Society and are designed to bring cutting-edge discoveries of space and astronomy to you from the people who are doing the research themselves. These hangouts are a chance for you to interact with professional astronomers and learn directly from their research papers because Carol goes to great lengths to make sure we talk about interesting science that's happening in this golden age of astronomy. And uh, Today we're going to be talking about Mars. And our guests are from the university, or Penn State University. They have released results back in June at the summer meeting of the American Astronomical Society that suggest that Mars would have, if it would have started off would have started off warmer and wetter if it had begun closer to the sun and slowly moved outward. Now our guests today have modeled what would have happened if during the early solar system Mars started off in a warmer place like oh I don't know near Venus for example. So today we're going to be talking about this model, how likely this was to have actually happened and what it tells us about Mars history and possible future. Now, I put a link to the, I usually put a link to the paper in Astro PH in the description box, but I couldn't find one there. So I'm posting the link to a space.com article, which we're going to clarify some points that were made in there. And I also put a link to the abstract on the Harvard Ads, uh, Ads Fabs uh, data, I never can say that right, the Astronomical Database System, uh, Astronomical Data System Database, uh, where you can take a look at the uh, abstract at least and follow along. Now we are we're recording these live and we're taking your questions and comments on the live YouTube chat as well as the uh, Discord server. And if you don't know what our Discord server is, you need to get on it because you click on the link in the description box and there we are and I'm looking at it 24-7. I really am. I'm always on it. So uh, you can ask your questions and comments that way. And if you happen to be watching this after the live stream is over, then uh, please uh, feel free to continue to ask questions and comments on those on the videos because I will be there and I will either try to answer them myself or I can maybe forward them to our guests to answer via email. So it's good to it's good to see everybody. I will also and this is a brand new thing. I've started posting the audio of all of these hangouts on our podcast, the Deep Astronomy Podcast. Uh, and if you go to anchor.fm slash deep astronomy, you can catch it on Spotify and I don't know, you know, the podcast world, wherever you can get a podcast, you can get it. So there you go. Let me bring up everybody. Here is all of our, here's all of us here down in the lower left corner is my good friend and colleague whom I haven't seen in months. Dr. Carol Christian from the Center for Emerging Media. Hi, Carol. Why are you laughing? Hi. Am, I, am I making you uh, laugh? I'm, I'm happy to be uh, actually <laughs> back in the U.S. <laughs> yes, I was traveling all August and I couldn't connect um, very well. But um, I'm glad to be back because uh, these are my favorite hangouts. And this is really exciting. You know, I'm not a planetary or exoplanet astronomer, although I'm very interested in the subject. And there's always this talk about planets migrating this way and that. And I'm like, yeah, seriously? Um, you know, because hot Jupiters are the ones that's that the ones I always we, hear. We, the hot Jupiters, they find, and then they're right next to their sun, and yay, they were way it formed way way out like ours did, and then came in and all this stuff. So, um, I'm really interested in the possibility that things could migrate around in our solar system because we're not used to that concept. So yeah, maybe it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, I agree. Maybe before we get our guests introduced, can you talk a little bit about the spirit of these hangouts for the AAS? Surely. So in academic and research um, places, most of you know that we have something called science coffee or astronomy coffee. And we talk among ourselves about the current research. And also if we have a visitor who's going to give a colloquium or something, um, we drag them into Astro Coffee, get them some coffee and say, hey, tell us about your research. And it's very informal. Um, and we get to a little bit of the behind the scenes of the research that goes on. 
uh, rather than the formalized colloquia. So we thought Tony and I and a few others, Alberto Conti and Harley Thompson and I were like, you know, it would be really good to it if we could include people in astronomy coffee. Uh, and that's what this is about. It's an informal discussion to peek behind the scenes of how the research is done, um, theory, computational models, uh, observations, all that stuff. How do we do this stuff? Why do we do it? How do we come to the conclusions that we come to? What's next? Next, all that stuff. That's right. Good. Thank you, Carol. Well, Galaxy is commenting that she has missed you, Carol. So she's glad oh, you're back. I miss you too, Galaxia. <laughs> I do. So, yeah. I do. Yeah. We got a lot of when you're not here, it's just not the same for sure. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's not the same. But I appreciate being missed. <laughs> yeah. So my guests today are both from Penn State University. Uh, Dr. Darren Williams is a planetary astronomer uh, at Penn State at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics there, and uh, he and also joining me is Cole Brown. Uh, an undergraduate student that works in the he's a physics student uh, working with Dr. Williams on this paper that we're going to be talking about so welcome guys um, which one of you wants to give us the the 40,000 foot view of the research and the model that you're doing give us a just maybe a big summary of what you're doing well for, first of all it, let me just say that uh, Penn State University has 19 campuses and the, the big one that everybody knows about is in State College, Pennsylvania, which right. is in the center of the state. We are at the second largest of the campuses up on Lake Erie. It's called the Barron Campus. And, oh. and we have an undergraduate physics major and an undergraduate physics or astronomy minor. And Cole Brown just happens to be uh, majoring in physics. Uh, he's one of our senior physics majors and minoring in astronomy here. Oh. Now, it, it, now, when I was going to the University of Colorado, they had this thing where you could be a physics major and then have one, be part of one of three plans. One of them had an astrophysics emphasis. Is it similar at Penn State where yes. you can take a lot of astronomy classes? And I guess enough to take an astronomy minor. Yeah, enough. you can take enough uh, to constitute an astronomy minor. Uh, they do have a major at the University Park main campus in State College. Uh, but here, our, our department yeah, is. But you don't want that. Phys fun. Physics is way, way better than astronomy. It's, I, I agree. <laughs> I keep agree. telling everybody that astronomy is just applied physics. That's exactly right. So, okay, let's get started on your model. Who had this idea? And first of all, and, and applied chemistry and applied biology, yes, by and the applied, way, and applied math. And applied math <laughs> and some applied engineering. So I would say I'm sensing a bias here among all of us about this this <laughs> physics thing, this this thing that we do. Uh, yes, well, I agree. All of these things are are, are absolutely applied. So let's uh, the paper that you've written is about Mars having been warmer if it had started and wetter if it had started close to the sun, which makes a lot of sense. It's closer, it's warmer, it's wetter. But what, did this actually happen? I mean, what, what, who, where did this come from, I guess is my question. Yeah, yeah well, I was actually at the DPS meeting last October. Now, DPS in, is what now? Uh, the Division of Planetary Science meeting. They have an annual meeting in October. Mm -hmm. And last year it was in Salt Lake City. And while I was there, uh, I can't say anything else, but it, it, this idea came to me. I, and I don't know from where, but I've been thinking about these issues for about 20 years now, because 20 years ago, I was a graduate student of Jim Casting. And some of the audience members might know of Jim Casting. He's a professor of geoscience at uh, Penn State main campus. And he's still there. Right. And he, we, we still talk and collaborate uh, remotely, but he's been trying to figure out the Mars problem for 30, 40 years now by doing climate modeling uh, with different atmospheres, different, uh, different constituents in the atmosphere, different pressures, uh, different conditions. And his latest result, I think, is the answer. Um, if you could show slide nine. Yep, let me get there and I will. Hold that's on. his latest. That's his latest paper. He, him and his uh, fellow researchers on climate of Mars. How do you make Mars warm enough uh, to have liquid water on its surface long ago? And one way of doing it is to have an atmosphere that is a little bit denser than uh, than what we have here on Earth, uh, consisting of uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And the hydrogen can come from the photodissociation of 
of methane, water, and maybe also H2S that leaks leaks out of the crust of Mars. Now, so what? Go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. go ahead. I, w- I was just going to ask if this uh, paper had the same premise. Was Mars closer? With no, 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 no. Oh, I no. See. So, so what I'm saying is that this paper that Casting and others have recently published is the culmination of some 30, 30 to 40 years of work by Jim Casting and others uh, uh, trying to make Mars warmer by changing the atmosphere. And, and this may be right. This, this, the answer uh, here may be right that Mars's atmosphere was different. But what has never been suggested or, uh, or developed very well very thoroughly is the idea that Mars could have been closer to the sun long ago and that somehow it, uh, it made it out to its present distance. The only way to do that uh, and have it, have it be warm for some time and close to the sun for some time and then move uh, almost instantaneously out to its present orbit is to somehow store it in the inner solar system closer to the sun than it is today. And there is one way to do it. And this is what came to me last October. And I immediately, when I came home, I shared it with uh, with Cole Brown and his uh, uh, another student, Quinn Bierbaum, who are the co-authors on this paper. And I said, if we can find a way to put Mars in orbit around Venus and then have it tidally evolve away from Venus, stripped away from Venus after some time, lost to the sun, and then have it migrate out to its present or near its present location, uh, then that will be worth considering. The astronomical community will have to take it seriously. So a few weeks later, I forget when, Cole. uh, uh, Almost exactly a year ago. um, Yeah, Cole came to me. Well, uh, this, the the October meeting uh, uh, was, was a little bit, further up but uh, I think November or December you came to me and you said look the computer shows that you can actually start Mars uh, around Venus and have it ejected from Venus and it migrates a certain percentage of the time out to its present orbit so you started so you (laughs) I like how you started that sentence so if we can find a way to put Mars in orbit around Venus and then have it almost instantaneously get to where it is now, yeah. then you can. Then your model shows a lot of what might have happened on present day Mars. Well, if you uh, if you can show slide eleven, slide eleven uh, is a is a complicated, busy plot uh, showing uh, the ages of the Martian. Uh, surface features, which indicate that it was warm and wet a long time ago, and the dates on that uh, show that Mars was Mars had water be- between three billion years ago and uh, and four and a half. Uh, between four and a half and about four, that's the Noachian period, uh, and then and then uh, after that, it's the Hesperian period. You have to memorize th- those things, but. But anyway, we're we're focused on the Noachian period because the sun is only seventy or seventy five percent its present luminosity at that time. It was it was fainter than today. Are the scales on these two plots the same? So you have Earth above at four point five four giga. What is that? What is GA? Giga years? Yeah, giga giga años. Años, okay. Right. And then uh, and then you have four point six down here below with Mars. So yes. there's the pre Noachian, and then I never heard these the Noachian uh, era, which would have been about four billion years ago here on Earth, which was the beginning or straddles the Archean period here, which right. Earth was really weird back then. It was not at all like what it is now. No. Um, and so this is when. So when when so you show down below these areas what was going on on mars like a lot of volcanism uh, the yeah tarsus, and where the it says formation yeah focus your attention on the fluvial glacial surface alteration okay that's uh, that indicates part. periods where mars must have been warmer either because of an atmospheric greenhouse like casting is modeled 
or because it was closer to the sun. So this is a way, if I'm not, if I'm getting this right, this is a way of getting Mars to be warmer in the past with liquid water on it. It, it is, but it's also a way to store it for long period, for astronomical timescales at higher solar fluxes that would enable Mars to be warm and wet for a long period of time before magically uh, migrating to its present location. Because where it is now is not capable, obviously, of keeping water present. But That's right. what about things like the atmosphere being thicker and, and, and different than it is now? What about that? Wouldn't that have... Right, right. So so on that plot, you, you see that Mars was, was warm and wet, apparently, uh, up until about 3 billion years ago, 3G... 3.0 GA, and and that uh, that may require, or even beyond, so two and a half to three, that may require a different atmosphere for some of it. But what I'm focused on is the are no, the I features can. are the features on Mars that uh, appear to be as old as uh, 4.3, 4.4. Uh, down to about three and a half billion years ago, and okay. those would re those would require either an absurdly strong greenhouse or having Mars at a dif different distance, closer to the sun. Okay, so that explains why you say if we can find a way of getting Mars closer to the sun and in storage, as you put it, then we yeah. can see a lot. We can we can s explain a lot of the things that we see now. Yeah, around Venus though. Well, you can you can also put it around Earth if you want, but Earth has its own satellite today, right? And dynamically, you, you can't move. We can't destroy or perturb the Moon too much, and uh, and so we it would actually be better, according to Casting, who I, I've spoken to about this result. Uh, he doesn't like the, the idea of putting it around Venus so much because he says. You do that, and Mars would get cooked, so that it wouldn't have any chance of being warm and wet. It's pretty but, darn close. But if uh, if Venus and and Mars as a satellite were on the inner edge of the habitable zone at that time, and they didn't have oceans of water, but rather just small amounts of surface water, like dune planets. If you could bring up slide sixteen. Okay. Slide 16 refers to the to the Dune uh, series. Oh yeah, it was a good book. Written, that was written really by good. Frank Herbert back in 1965, and there are there are lots of planets now in science fiction that are that are like this, Tatooine and Star Wars, in which there's there's almost no water, but these planets are in or close to the habitable zone around their star. And so if Mars and Venus, early Venus, were like this, uh, then they wouldn't have immediately succumbed to a runaway greenhouse, which is what casting is worried about. But they wouldn't have had much water either. They wouldn't have had much water either, but, but uh, enough to erode the surface if it rained a little bit, maybe a foot per year. Because if you stay if you stay in orbit around Venus at those distances for hundreds of millions of years, uh, you you can get a foot per year, which is what's raining in the deserts on Earth today. Uh, you can get surface features comparable to the Nurgle Vallis and Nanetti Vallis, which are shown in slide four and slide five. Okay. Of the. Uh, these are the iconic images of Mar Martian uh, erosion, and these were these were probably produced by millions of feet of water rushing over the surface. But those millions of feet of water could have been provided by a trickle uh, of rain, small amounts of rain, over millions of years. Okay, so the um, you have a. You have an animation. Does that animation show the mechanics of how this would work? Uh, what it does is it sh is it shows a way 
uh, to, to form a Mars Venus binary. Okay, I'm going to have this looping while if you want to talk about it. The, uh, there are other, there are many ways of forming a Mars Venus binary, but this is the one we consider in the paper a glancing collision between a Mars sized object and a Venus sized yeah, object. Mar Venus. So is this, is this what Cole worked on? Uh, Cole didn't do the animation. Did, did. No, but, what, what, what Cole did is he, I, what I said that Cole should do, his assignment was when Mars tidally leaves Venus, then where does it go? So he did the orbital oh, okay. calculations after, okay. after Mars left. So Venus. we'll get to that. Because yes. I want to hear him talk about yes. this. Okay. Yes, okay. So hang on. We're looking at Mars and orbiting Venus, it looks like. And then something comes along. No, wait. It looks like Mars hits Venus. Yes. Yes. So in, or <laughs> in order to capture Mars around Venus, we, we imagine a glancing blow between a Mars-like thing. Although it has to be twice the, around twice the mass of Mars because a lot of it gets lost. And how do we know? We didn't simulate the collision. Uh, these, these hypotheses come from SPH, smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations of Pluto and Charon. Charon is the big moon of Pluto. Uh -huh. and, and that, we think, was also captured by Pluto a long time ago. And it started out twice, Charon did, twice the mass of, it, of what it is presently. And it loses about 50% of its mass on collision. So the Mars that came in was probably bigger before it collided with Venus and then lost half of its mass to become a Mars-sized object. Okay, so this is a simulation or a, uh, a, a, a run-through of what of how Mars would have gotten captured by yes. Venus in, yeah. into and the this state. Is, this is one, one a possible, scenario. Sure, sure. And this is how it would have happened. And we're yes. looking at, what, four billion years ago? Four, four and a half. Four and a half billion years ago. Four and a half. And the reason why is because, is because this event has enough energy to melt the entire mantle of Mars. It's doing and a good no, job on Venus, too. And it would do, do the same thing to Venus. And so that has to happen right at the beginning of, of time, basically, for the planets. Because, because the, uh, the craters on Mars have been dated. They, the age esti estimates are... are uh, are younger than four and a half billion years, except for the Borealis crater, which is the whole northern hemisphere of Mars looks like it, it was compromised by something four and a half billion years ago. So this this event, this supposed collision, has to take place uh, before four and a half billion years ago. Okay, right well, at the, so you right at the beginning. So you've done it. You've you've gotten Mars um, captured by Venus. Yeah. Where it is in a state where you're saying it's on the edge of a habitable zone. I'm I'm kind of making sure I understand what we're talking about, yeah. so I'm going to repeat yeah. A, yeah. some stuff. And then yeah. this is – and because we're on the edge of that – now, okay, we're on the edge of the habitable zone of the sun as it existed four and a half billion years ago because the sun has had an evolution of its own. It was, I think, right. hotter back right. then than it is now. And so the habitable zone would have shifted a little bit more, but I'm, I'm sure you've taken that into account as yes. well. Yes. Uh, and so the amount of water that you can get to have happen here is enough to make these early features of Mars uh, look the way they do. How, yeah. how then are we going, how does Mars then leave Venus influence? Right, right. So just like the moon around the Earth is slowly drifting away, uh, the the spin of the earth is slowing down and the moon is accelerating away so that it will eventually billions of years from now probably beyond the age of the sun uh it it takes place on a long time scale for the earth moon system but but for mars and venus it would take the time scale for tidal evolution of mars away from venus would happen on one tenth the time scale so instead of things happening on fi a 5 billion year time scale, it would happen on a 500 million year time so scale. So this, this is the same thing now that is causing yeah. the moon to get further away from the earth. Yes. 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 Why so is it Venus, happening so much faster? I don't get it. Uh, because, because Mars and Venus are both more massive and they would be uh, closer together 
uh, than the Earth and Moon are today around. Yeah. around so they're the Earth. they're so, spinning around each other faster, or presumably Mars is spinning yeah. around Venus faster, yes. uh, and their centrifugal centripetal ex, what is it acceleration or forces are, are well are they're stronger. they're pull, they're pulling on each other and causing them to be asymmetric in shape, and those asymmetries are what grabs on to each object and accelerates Mars away. Uh, and, and it happens very sl slowly uh, on a five billion year time scale for the Earth Moon system, uh, but it happens on one tenth that time scale for, for Venus and Mars. Okay. And, and so, what in order for this to work, Venus has to be spinning really fast at, at the beginning, and it, which it can do after the impact of the Mars sized object. It spins, spins Venus up really fast, and then Mars extracts some of that angular momentum from Venus moving away from it. Um, and then once it gets out to about, what is it, Cole, 78? It, it, it depends, but uh, 80 is a, a nice good, 80 Venus radii is a good number to, to go with. Yeah, right about, now, right now around the Earth, uh, the moon is at 60 Earth radii. Uh, so it's it's not going to escape the Earth anytime soon. But in the case of Mars around Venus, it leaves Venus at around 78 or 80 Venus radii. And this would have happened roughly 500 million years after it was captured. Yes, indeed. Oh, wow. Indeed. Okay. Well, um, let's get something cleared up real quick because Condor Boss is asking a question I don't know the answer to. Wasn't the sun cooler in the early solar system? Was it warmer or cooler in the I don't. I forget. Cooler. Uh, it was cooler. Yeah, it was cooler. Okay, so I, spoke, I misspoke. So thank you, Condor Boss. You're right about that. Um, Mr. Tickles wants to know. Um, that's a great handle, man. I don't know. I, I, I need to do that. Uh, well, then why isn't Mars made of iron? It, it being the core of the predecessor planet, or is it actually mostly iron? So, and, and in a related question, wouldn't we, could we test this by seeing if both, mo well, no, actually, okay, let me just ask it the way he, he said it. Then why isn't Mars made of iron, it being the core of the pre predecessor planet, or is it actually mostly iron? Uh, Mars today uh, has a smaller iron core by percentage than, by per mass percentage than the Earth does. Uh, and so its density, its overall density is less than the Earth. You can think of Mars as, as being Nerf compared to the Earth, which, is, which has an average density 23% uh, higher. Uh, so, so, so Earth is harder than Mars is. So we think that Mars does have an iron core, uh, but it's just smaller. It just has less, less iron. Uh, by in percentage than the Earth does. Okay, so Cole, um, uh, Mars gets to within or gets outside eighty Venus radii away. It starts to pull away, and then, from what I understand, you took it from there, right? Where did, what happens that, to Mars? That is right. Uh, so originally, when when Dr. Williams approached me uh, with, with this idea, his, his main question for me was, what would happen to Mars if it were at an escape distance around Venus? So if it were at that threshold where it wouldn't stay around Venus, it, it, would, it would run away. Uh, where does it go is the ultimate question. And, and it, can do, it can do a lot of things, I found. Um, but uh, in general, it, it expands away from Venus. Its orbit, its orbit expands and it, it goes farther out into the solar system. You know, it, and it does this through many, many close encounters with Venus uh, right after it escapes and then with Earth later on. So after Mars escapes, once uh, it's more attracted to the sun than it is to Venus overall, um, it g goes into a very rapidly changing orbit that overlaps with Venus's at first. And uh, so it comes in close to Venus many, many times. And these close interactions between the two uh, exchange angular momentum between the planets. They, they push Venus in a little bit, make, it, make its orbit a little smaller, and they expand Mars's orbit. Uh, sometimes uh, the simulations would end in a, in a negative way for, for our hypothesis <laughs> and Mars would hit Venus and, you know, that's where we would end the simulation and start anew. Um, but other times Mars would not hit Venus, it would encounter it and then begin to expand away. And as it did, it would eventually come in close contact with Earth, where this process of having close encounters would happen again, but this time with the Earth. 
And again, it would sometimes hit the earth. Uh, other times, however, when it didn't hit the earth, it would scatter outward by the earth, pushing the earth inward a little bit. Um, whereas Mars goes out further because it's less massive, it, it is uh, flung further. And it would eventually come to rest in an orbit near its present one. Um, Mars is at about 1.58 astronomical units from the sun today. And in the simulations, uh, Mars in runs where it did make it outward. It did tend to go outward from, from Venus. It uh, ended in orbits between 1.2 and 1.8 astronomical units. Yeah, we should show slide 42. Okay. Uh, which, which shows the path and the migration of uh, two examples where Mars starts where Venus is and then moves out to near its present. So, so what percentage of the time does it not hit the Earth? <laughs> I mean, well, I think there would be some remnant of, of this encounter on Earth. Well, the, 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 in a sense, the, the, there wouldn't be. Um, if, if Mars just encountered Earth, um, it, it could encounter the Earth-Moon system and, and leave it unscathed, so long as the encounter wasn't too slow or too close. If it was too close, it could obviously either hit the, sure. Earth or the Moon, or it could, um, if it was going too slow and too close, stick around too long and, and mess with the Moon's orbit. But Okay, um, so I'm, I'm sort of, because I'm in Florida and I just came from Baltimore, I'm thinking about hurricane, you know, the ensemble. So I'm thinking the ensemble says something happened. So in the ensemble, is it, is it, does it get near earth a lot of the time? And does it get near earth a, what per, some high percentage or is it very hundreds, unlikely? Hundreds, hundreds of close encounters. <laughs> okay. Yes, it, okay. It the earth. Well, comes, that's not good, is it? I mean, that tells no. me. No. That no, tells no, me. No, no, no. Wait, wait. That tells me that your model is very sensitive. Yes. To it is. Getting at yes. You, you got to really it, tweak this just right. Uh, the the migration wouldn't have happened. So e each encounter between the Earth and Mars gives Mars a teeny little speed boost, which allows its orbit to expand. And those accumulated encounters with the Earth expand its orbit enough to get it out to near where it is today. Most of the encounters, however, although they were cl you know, close by, by our definition, they were not close enough to perturb the moon. In order to mess with the moon or mess with the Earth, uh, Mars would have to, uh, the encounter that Mars would have to experience would have to be really slow and very, very close. Encounters that were this close and slow did not happen in the simulations very often. In fact, they okay. are exceptionally rare, less than 1% of That's the That's what I wanted to hear. Okay, so you can get Mars to where it is now without hitting the Earth or hitting Venus a whole bunch of times. Actually, a pretty – so it's likely, as I guess my the way I want to put this. It's likely, then, that, you're, um, that Mars will end up, according to your model, where it is that's now. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. In the ensemble of models, what percentage of the time yeah. does it hit Venus? And what percentage of the time does it come really close to Earth? Uh, is it unlikely, about, likely, 50%, 80%? Talk about percentages. I was just trying to figure. <laughs> uh, do you, Dr. Williams, do you have the uh, yes. statistics table as yes. one of your slides? Slide 44. Well, okay. wait a second. Do you still want me to show 42? Yes. All right, let me put 42 up. <laughs> first 42 my one comment on 42 it, it, um is that where the the red curve is the distance approximately the distance mars is from the sun when, when that curve is really really spiky when it's jumping up and down a lot that those are epochs in or eras in the simulation where mars is encountering venus or more likely earth many many times uh, so it is those really spiky regions in, in that in that figure where those encounters that we just talked about are taking place okay I you're gonna need to explain more because I I don't I, I I get the spikiness I get that's bad, uh. But what am I looking at? There's a there's a blue line, a red line, and a yellow line. Okay, so um, the spikiness is actually good in, in a sense. Um, oh, no, so you just the, said that's hitting other things, didn't you? Well, it's not hitting; it's coming close to. Um, the the red curve uh, to explain the colors here. The the red curve is the approximate distance Mars is from the sun. The blue is the approximate distance Earth is from the sun. It, the golden one is the approximate distance Venus is from the sun. So Mars or the red curve starts on top of the yellow orange curve, um, and then it, it drifts out. That that's the where I started my simulations is where Mars was on top of Venus, but far enough away from it that it escapes. 
and then it evolves outward as you can as you can see the the evolution of the red curve um, but where the red curve is spiky the distance from mars is rapidly changing and that is because of a result or resulting from encounters between earth and mars mostly not collisions they never hit each other or else oh, okay i misunderstood end, right. but, um but they, they, but they, they exchange, affect their orbits yeah they exchange momentum uh okay by pulling on each other yep one gets slowed down and the other one gets sped up okay all right now do you want me to put up 46 or yeah 44 well this is gra essentially gravity assist except in the cases yes. of gravity assist there was a big differential between the satellite and like jupiter and a yes. wee satellite yes okay 46 is up or 44 sorry no, 44 right yeah I really, right, for some so reason, want to show 46. Cole, Cole, can you see that? Um, I no, can not. Okay. No, but. Um, let me ahead. bring it up. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't <laughs> show you what I'm broadcasting. Okay. Uh, so there were 100, how many, Cole? 100 and. Uh, it says 87 total simulations. Collisions with Venus, 46. Yes. Ejections, four. <laughs> Inward scattering yes. four. <laughs> Let me pull this up on my end and I'll follow along with you guys okay. here. Okay. So it's 119 total simulations. Okay. In, including uh, the prograde escape. Oh, uh, yeah. If you add them together, yes, I see. And then retrograde escape. Right. And there is no, it, it is not statistically or physically significant whether it escapes prograde or whether it escapes oh, okay. moving in the opposite direction. Huh. Uh, but both. Both situations are just as likely, hmm. and and we, if you add up the the number of ones highlighted in black, where the where Mars ends up between one point two and one point eight, with a small eccentricity, which means the final orbit is is not very elliptical. Uh, there are ten successful cases there out of the one hundred nineteen total simulations All right so that is the answer uh, i think what you were after before uh what is the uh percentage the likelihood of this happening it's about uh 11 or well if you include getting out to 1.2 to 1.8 with a high eccentricity if you include those it's around 12 percent of the time Okay, well, that seems like you got to, boy, Mars must have been lucky then, because, uh, I don't know, that doesn't seem very high to me. Uh, no, no, and neither was the probability that the young Earth was hit by a Mars-sized thing to produce the moon. I see, okay, so we're, we're talking about the same level of, of likelihood here. Of probability, yeah, yeah. Okay. Of probability. Yeah. All right. So, um, all right. Well, so the the paper that you uh, that you wrote exp pushed all of this out. What what do you guys think is the likelihood uh, that this happened this way? Cole, you want this first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, I I don't necessarily believe that th th uh, this chain of events is what caused Mars to have been warm and wet in the past. However, it definitely deserves to be on the table of, of different ways in which it could have happened. Um, simply saying that Mars was once warm and wet because it had a very, very thick atmosphere is, is, could be correct, but it doesn't look at all possibilities. There, there are more, more than one ways to skin the cat, if, if you will. Okay. Um, and I believe all the different ways in which Mars could have been wet um, should be investigated and, and mentioned, this being one of them. Because, Cole, if, correct me if I'm wrong, the way Mars is now, we're under, and even if you give it some super heavy-duty greenhouse gassing in the past, it's not enough, is it, to get what we see in the erosion patterns and things like that on Mars? Do I have that right? I'm no I'm no climate scientist, but I, I think you could get close and you could potentially get, get, give Mars enough of an atmosphere, even today, to allow water to flow on its surface, maybe briefly. 
um, but it would have to be a very, very dense atmosphere, something that might not be very easily explained for a planet the size of Mars with a low or no magnetic field to protect it. Right. Well, let's get to that. I want to ask about the magnetic field because right now Mars has no uh, real dynamo. Uh, it doesn't have a very active core. The The crust is not very active tectonically. Uh, Darren, if you look at Mars early on, do you get that with it when it was around Venus or perhaps the energy uh, when of the collision had a molten core? Was there ever a time when Mars had a magnetic field? Yeah, wh whether a planet has a molten core or not depends both on its size, its age, as well as its spin rate. And one of the one of the pesky uh, consequences, one of the negative consequences of Mars spending hundreds of millions of years around Venus would be that its spin would slow dramatically to thousands of hours. And that flies, wow. in, flies in the face of what we see today. But Mars has a spin rate of 25 hours. But, but there, there is a paper, uh, there are actually two papers, which suggest that Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars, were produced by an impact, an impact of an object uh, two one hundredths of a Mars mass, and that that impact uh, could actually explain one uh, one of the larger basins on Mars, not the Northern Hemisphere Caloris or uh, Borealis basin, but uh, but one of the smaller basins, maybe Elysium, for example. And you can you can take Mars uh, without a spin and hit it to produce a disk of material from which Phobos and Deimos can then accrete. And that, that impact then uh, can give Mars the 25 hour day uh, that it has today. Uh, so the fact that Mars loses its spin around Venus is, is not a, uh, a, a, an extreme negative result. We, we can we can argue that it was hit later on by something. And would this interaction uh, explain a lot of what we see about Venus' current uh, spin rate? Uh, Venus's spin rate uh, is actually today is actually slower than it would be with Mars in orbit around it. Right. So having left when Mars left, then yeah, it it's would... uh, it, it Mars could have uh, could have left leaving Venus with a with a really slow spin rate, which was slowed even further afterward when its atmosphere swelled up perhaps during a runaway greenhouse phase. Okay. Atmospheric tides do a number on the spin of Venus. And also, uh, I guess it affects our own moon as well, right? The tides are what, I guess it's that energy release that or is, is causing the moon to actually go away too, right? Or yes, some, yes, yeah, indeed. Right. Uh, and, and slowing the Earth. Right, and that's what Condor Boss was commenting. The migration of the moon is primarily due to tides. Um, Galaxy is asking, are there people from the Carolinas and Virginia here? Um, well, if they are, then they are some hardcore space fans, and welcome, guys. But I have a feeling they're probably uh, uh, evacuating. At least I would be if I were them. So I don't, I don't know if that's... Or they're way inland. Or they're if they way went inland. yesterday, they're way inland. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um Okay, let's see. Lo Loic uh, Peron is asking: Is there some water on the on the pole north and south of the planet, and how is that formed? the The ice caps, I guess, he's talking about. On yeah, Mars. yeah, yeah. The ice caps, uh, primarily uh, frozen water, frozen CO two uh, mixed in. Uh, one of them, I f I forget which one is is completely CO two, and the other one is a mix of CO two and water. Anyway. If you have uh, if you have water and under high pressure uh, down underneath the uh, one of the poles, uh, then you could actually have a, a lake of unfrozen water under there. Cool. So that that has actually been a recent result reported by one of the spacecraft. I forget which one. Is it Maven? Maybe. Maven. Yeah. Perhaps. Okay. Uh, let's see. Matt and. Um or mad end, uh, how do all the other planets interfere with that, especially Jupiter, as some theories say it was much closer to the sun in the early solar system? That's a good point. Do you, did you guys worry about Jupiter much? 
Yeah, uh, we did, uh, but it was closer to the sun. According to the uh, to the TAC model, uh, it was closer to the sun right when it was forming, four and a half billion plus years ago. How close was Jupiter then? Uh, we we think it dipped all the way down uh, into the uh, into the Mars region, uh, or at least the the inner asteroid belt. Okay. All right. Before wow, that's pretty. Moving, moving would back. That, would that have helped stabilize the Mars orbit? No, because at that point Mars was still in... Mars was still figuring itself out. It was either <laughs> it, it was either colliding and orbiting v Venus. <laughs> Or it was perhaps somewhere else in the solar system. If it was, if it was where it is or near where it is today, and Jupiter came in like that, then there's a good chance that it wouldn't have survived. Uh, but when Jupiter was doing that during those formative time periods, uh, Mars probably wasn't fully accreted. This was right at the beginning of of the solar system. Which I believe that's that's part of the motivation for the the grand tack hypothesis was to explain why Mars is is slightly smaller than the other terrestrial planets. Mm -hmm. Another thing that that could have happened is when Jupiter moved in, it could have destabilized Mars if it was somewhere in that region and and gave it an elliptical orbit that caused it to to hit Venus in the first place. Ah, um, okay. huh. So it, 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 Mars could have been completely unaffected by Jupiter's movements, or it could have been greatly, greatly affected, depending on, on where it was, things that I don't think are answerable, um, unfortunately. All right, Larry, oh, Ke right. Larry Keese is asking, hi, Larry, it's good to see you again, by the way. Um, hi, Cole. Sounds like you have a great prof to help. Sure does. Uh, what, did, what did you learn about orbital dynamics, and how much did you learn about simulation? Good question. Well, I learned well everything that I know. I learned through this up up into the up into what this year point, are Doctor Williams. In your, in your degree, are you a junior, sophomore? What are you? Senior? I am a senior, senior? Um, seventh semester. Um, so this term and, and one more to go. Um, Doctor Williams taught me everything I knew about orbital dynamics, and then when he asked me um, to to run these simulations, I, I took it a step further um, on my own accord um, and found some softwares to to perform these kind of orbital integrations and, and learn how to use them. And um, it, it was a bit of a learning curve, but with enough time on, on Stack Overflow and uh, trial and error, I was able to, to get it to work and, and be reliable. Okay, and, now you're starting to get my ears perked up. I'm a software engineer, worked in that for 30 years. And so <laughs> I got I got to ask you some nerd questions. It's about to get real nerdy, folks. Uh, I'll do okay, my best so, to answer them. No, oh, yeah, what, all I want to know is, uh, what, what did you write the simulation yourself from scratch? Uh, and if so, what, did, what language did you use? I or, used Python. Um, I'm very, very loyal to Python. Okay, and a lot of astronomers uh, are. The, I use, in order to perform the integrations, I use an existing uh, open source software called Rebound. And uh, however, the setup of, of the initial conditions and uh, the parameters and the layout of the solar system, I inputted myself. Um, the way the data, data was analyzed was, was, all, was all done by myself. Um, the, the only external resource was the, the integrating package of, of Rebound, which is a Python module. Rebound? Seriously? Rebound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is what's called. It is a uh, fantastic software. Shout out to the, the teams that have, have been working on that and have made it uh, open and free. Good, good. Okay. Yeah, it's, out, it's outstanding. It's, it's easy to use. But also, uh, Cole is very, very good with, uh, with Python programming. So what I said to Cole was, well, we have this great project. And what we need is somebody who can run, do these runs and babysit them, but also uh, immediately spit out the graphs uh, showing the distances and the shapes of the orbits and stuff. And, and that's exactly what he did. I, I would ask him occasionally in the hallway, how are things going? And he would say, well, I just looked at the plots and, and Mars is still uh, moving between Earth and Venus or, or Mars is at one and a half AU and it looks like it's stable. So he was able to tell me, give me day-to-day day -day feedback on where 
Mars was, and that was so useful and helpful to me. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad we're talking about this because we get a lot of interest in these hangouts for budding astronomers, people who want to know what kind of skills they need to do astronomy, and this is one of them, folks. So if you can learn Python, know how to interact in, in, with the uh, language and produce plots like Cole's been doing, huge, huge skill set. Um, not the least of which the fact that, uh, Cole, your name is on a paper now, and you're not, you haven't even graduated yet. So that is an awesome, I think, uh, step up. Uh, so kudos. Review. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed on, on oh, that Oh, it's one. still in peer review. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Yeah. Best of luck on that. So, uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, my, my question scrolled by. Let me go back up to the chat here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, is the water is the water? This is from Lo Loic uh, Peron again. Uh, is the water um, is the water similar to Earth? Do you mean is there is is the water amount similar to Earth? How much water, I guess, are we talking about here on Mars compared to Earth? Uh, today or in the past? Uh, well, in the past, in, in when when things started out, when you were starting your simulations, well, in uh, order to in order to get the water flows and the things that we that we see. Uh, from Mars. Well, how much was uh, that? as I as I argue in the in the paper, as we argue in the paper, it could have been a Dune planet scenario. Where yeah, I mean, yeah, that's not a good example, Darren, because Dune, everybody knows, didn't even have enough water that you got to wear still suits. I mean, you got to recycle your own sweat. So. Right, right. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But but if you take any desert situation on the Earth today, uh, with maybe a foot. 12, 10, 12 inches of rainfall most uh, in the deserts of the Earth today, and apply that to early Mars around Venus. That's actually enough over millions and hundreds of millions of years. That's enough to produce the the canyons and the valleys that they're seeing on Mars today. That's actually quite remarkable. I did not know it took so little. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Millions, millions of feet of water are required. So if you're if you're only getting a foot of water per year then over over a million years you can you can erode these these valleys okay raj luthra wants to know and i guess i do too i'd like to know you guys opinion on this uh now as things are now in modern times with right with with russia why did i say that with mars um is it possible to terraform mars uh if if yes how long do you think it'll take do you think we can terraform it now in its current situation i know speculate just Give us your opinion. Well, I, I would say, I would say yes, but it's it's got to be driven by the economics of it or or the politics of it. Uh, it's going to cost a lot of money, uh, but if if it's if it's driven if people find a way to make money, or if there's some overriding political reason for for doing it, then then yeah, we know. We know how to terraform planets. We just we we don't have the resources and we don't have the money to do it, or even the the inspiration to the motivation to do it. Yeah, because we lose a lot too if we terraform Mars. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, where you know, yeah, we might be able to make it more of a habitable place for us, but you know, what have we lost as a result? We've lost a lot of the things that made you know the original. Uh, uh, footprint of Mars, and and it's that could be incalculable. We don't know what we're giving up uh, just to, to turn it into something else. And you're right, the amount of will and energy and money that one w it would take to do this has to be there. And uh, we can't even agree that. Well, never mind. Uh, okay, uh, launch pad astronomy. Would any of these interactions account for Venus uh, obliquity and spin rate? Uh, Venus's tilt and spin rate are largely a function of uh, two things. One, the atmospheric tides that I was talking about. When, when the atmosphere swells up to its present 100, 100 bar atmosphere, 100 times the atmospheric pressure in this room, when it does that, the sun interacts with the atmosphere, causing these atmospheric tides to slow the planet even further. But also, if, if Venus, before the atmosphere swells up, if Venus has a as a spin axis, which is on its side like this, then the tides act to straighten the spin axis like that so that it either ends up spinning right side up or upside down. And today it's spinning upside, it just happens to be spinning upside down, in other words, rotating 
retrograde backwards. Oh, good, good answer. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ga- f- game fish guy, gaming fish guy. Uh, well, first of all, I got to get to uh, Peter Quinn's comment. He's commenting. He's pointing out that the dune desert planet is called Arrakis. Yes, I know that. Uh, ga- <laughs> gaming fish guy. Today, w- would Venus contain some remnants of the Martian surface? Would you be able to find some of Mars on on Venus today if we could get there and look? Uh, Probably not, because when Venus went through its runaway greenhouse, uh, which we think might have happened after Mars left, when that happens, it actually heats the surface of Venus above the melting point of the material. So it would have been a magma ocean after or during the runaway greenhouse phase uh, when when Venus lost most of its water. And so what that would have done is is it would have effectively erased any remnant of the collision between uh, a primordial Mars and Venus. Okay, uh, good. And um... I think it is also believed that the uh, the surface of Venus is uh, refreshing on fifty to hundred million year timescales as well. So even if those issues didn't do in any evidence, the refreshing of the surface through volcanic activity might also do it in. That's a good point because Earth is doing the same thing. Earth is basically, but through its tectonic activity, is replenishing the crust every so ever million, hundred million years or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But but yeah, it's, it's Earth is doing the same thing. So these geologically active planets like Venus and Earth aren't going to keep things around for billions of years that are going to be too noticeable. Although we can see evidence of a lot of things here on Earth geologically from that far away. We have a very active surface of the planet and uh, it doesn't stay static for very long mars on right. the other hand is 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 pretty much on is, is it more would you say it's more or less the same as it was back when same it was as Venus? It, same as it was maybe two and a half three billion years ago uh but but not four and a half billion years ago okay uh, because because one it was more it was more volcanic and tectonically active a long time ago but also because it's been it's been bombarded uh, uh, through its early history by big things. And uh, Launchpad Astronomy wants to follow up. Uh, though he goes, thanks. Though that raises a question: What might have got Venus rotating on its side before atmospheric tidal friction? Uh, impacts, <laughs> maybe with maybe with a, an object the size of Mars. There you go. Okay. Uh, Christian, by the way, Launchpad Astronomy is Christian uh, Reddy. He is also going to be helping me with some telescope talking else later on. So good question. Uh, good question, Christian. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, well, I think that's most of the questions. Let me just check Discord if anybody's been leaving questions on there. Uh, I know people are answering my questions about the Twitch stuff. Okay, good. So, um, oh, James Allen, how long ago? <laughs> we'll leave it here with this question, and, and uh, you guys could just uh, – uh, uh, answer it in, as an opinion, I suppose. How long ago was Mars inhabited by life? He's not even raising the question, did it ever have life? We're just saying it is. So how long ago was it, fuck guys? How well, long how was life there? Still there? Yeah, just yesterday. Still, yesterday, <laughs> still there. Do you guys think there's life on Mars? Do you think we'll find it? Uh, I think there could be bacterial life, especially in those lakes that they're imagining exist below the pole, the polar do, ice caps. Do you think that life would be independent of life here elsewhere in the solar system? In other words, that it started from scratch there on Mars or that it came from somewhere else, like in a panspermia kind of way? Whatever we say, Cole and I, uh, will be a hypothesis. Uh, no, you're going to be held to it, and we're going to judge no, you no way to, There's no way to prove it. <laughs> but but uh, there there are ways, and people have shown, there are ways of starting it out either on Mars or Venus or Earth and then having it migrate through impacts yes. of asteroids and comets uh, through space and then populating a new world. Uh, so so we, we could actually have Earth life on Mars today uh, that was transported there 
after. Yeah, that that mechanism I think is quite uh, is quite well accepted and common. I just wish I could. I don't expect you guys to, but I mean, I've had evolutionary biologists on on where I've asked them point blank: Is it easy or hard to start life from a primordial ooze? And I don't. I never get a good answer. That this that, that, that the, the answer is nobody knows. Nobody uh, knows. And and that is you know is it easy or hard? And it, you know if it's easy, then it's everywhere. Life is everywhere. If it's hard, then not so much. You got a lot of things that that have to come into play. But we'll leave it there with Mars maybe having uh, li- life from other places that got there. Uh, it's probably I, I I think it's bad news if there's life on Mars, uh, <laughs> but there that there may be microbial life there. So great. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, I want to thank my guests. They are Darren Williams from he's a professor, a, a planetary astronomer from Penn State University, the one up by Lake Erie. Uh, he's he's a member of the uh, 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 Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics there, and his student Cole Brown, uh, an undergrad student in, in physics, who did a lot of the. Uh, I get the feeling, Cole, you did all the hard work. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah, it was easy for Darren to say, wasn't it? Yeah. Cole, go make uh, Mars out where go make Mars leave Venus and 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 right. go where it is now. Go yeah, somebody that. has to teach the classes. <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Carol, thank you for setting this up. This was a fun hangout yeah, sure. and it really uh, was. I was glad to see the article actually, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was good. Yeah, so neat. check it out. There's links in the description box to get more information. I guess Cole Cole is Cole, what uh is it is it astronomy and astrophysics? What what where's it coming out the paper if it gets accepted? If if, if it makes it through the review process, it will be in Icarus, the the planetary science. That journal. makes sense. Okay. Yeah, cool. Icarus. Yeah, all that right. makes sense. Yep. And cool. do you guys put things on Astro PH at all? I mean, preprints or no? Uh, we have we have not, but uh, there's no reason why we couldn't. Yes, because it helps us uh, neophytes be able to speed these papers without yeah, we, paying huge uh, subscription so, fees. Right. So for Hubble, we re- we recommend if you've really got something, a staggering result, to hold off on that until we can do the press release coincident with the... Okay. So lots of times we ask until the paper get accepted to not put it there. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, so may- yeah. maybe that was our hesitation. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a, it, wait for it to get accepted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we it we would like the planetary community's opinion first. Yes, good. Yeah, and things get misrepresented as well. But if the journalists, sometimes we find the journalists will start putting it out there and then you haven't had time to actually say it the way you want to, right. to convey the correct information. Right. So anyway, but this was fun. Thank you for agreeing yeah. to do that. And, yeah. and thank thank you both for, uh, yeah. for hosting hosting the thing and uh, getting us free press. You're welcome. Anytime. I hope you come <laughs> yeah. back. And uh, well, it's you get... a good experience. Yeah. yeah. Do the same thing with, uh, oh, I don't know, Saturn. Make it, make it do that. Uh... <laughs> All right, folks. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining. Okay. I want to, uh, I want to remind everybody we're back next Thursday with future in space hangout where I think Harley has lined up the, uh, uh, the follow up on the Lynx mission. This is one of four, missions being considered in the next decadal survey to uh, follow up with w go up past w first uh and uh we're going to be following up seeing how they've been doing we've already talked about uh, a lot of the other missions louvoir and, and others so this will be on the lynx mission so we hope you'll check up uh, next thursday and also we got a telescope talk hangout where we're going to talk with, with people on tuesday we're from the square kilometer array so uh, we'll see you guys then thank you all so much for uh watching and as always keep looking up Thank you. Bye. Thank you.